plants like these have gone from hippie trends to style setting favorites. More on them coming up. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the show. If you're like me, you love all kinds of plants, even curiously shaped plants like these. In today's show, we're going to focus on some of the succulents and cacti. You see, they're a great way to add a certain panache or chic to your garden. You can bring visual interest to the garden without maybe going down the route of marigolds or petunias, which add a lot of color. These can bring color, but also these interesting shapes and forms. Now to carry out this theme a little later, we're gonna meet a woman who is turning heads with succulent plant designs, like these. Wow, who wouldn't enjoy having these in their home? And speaking of interesting designs, we'll meet some topiary artists whose work can be seen in botanical gardens and homes across the Mid-South. And a little later, I'll answer a viewer question and we'll get a fresh garden recipe. And I'll take you to a garden on an estate that's open to the public. And I have to tell you, every time I'm around this place, I have to go in because there's always something new. So stay tuned. Now this is one of my favorite plants. I love it because it's so architectural. Now it's called agave americana or century plant. And this is the variegated form. You've probably seen the one that isn't variegated. It's a beautiful sort of slate glaucous blue gray. Now, what I love about this plant is that it can be a gorgeous focal point in a garden. In fact, I use it that way quite regularly. Now, what I want to point out here is that when you grow these, from time to time you're going to get a leaf that gets broken, and all I do is I just take the clippers and just snip it off like that. So if you have any of these that are damaged, you can just cut them off. And what's wonderful about this plant is that already, you can see right here we have what is called a little pup coming up, a baby agave americana. Now, I have to say, speaking of shape and form, that I'm a great fan of topiary artists who can do magical things with shape and form. They can take something simple and carry it to the sublime, and I can tell you some of these shapes can really inspire. Benoit Van Maldren and his wife Jennifer show us a sample of their work, which can also be seen in such places as the Memphis Botanical Garden. Well, let's talk about how to make a framed topiary. There are two different ways of doing the mossing. Uh, we can use either a fishing line that we just wrap around really tightly around the moss and the frame until we have a good result and very firm. Or we can use chicken wire. Um, this one is uh, just cut and bent with some pliers and held in place with uh, zip ties. So you take just a big piece of moss, you know, and uh, you push it tightly. We are going to finish this corner here. The plant will root faster when you put dirt in it. And we're going to finish it now to put the last piece of uh, chicken wire. So we're going to start by sizing a piece of chicken wire and then cut it to shape so it'll fit around it where we want it to bend it. Okay, here is the dragon, you know, we, I use three different kind of plants. They have variegated ivy, dwarf mondograss, and ajuga here for the body. I planted that one uh, probably two or three months ago. This kind of top here will be in the shade, you know, when you put it in your yard, because you now those uh, plants here, you know, don't like the full sun. So you see it doesn't take very much to complete one of those sm small ones. The big ones, of course, is a lot more work, but anybody can do this. Next, a preview of things to come in a Delaware garden. And if you're not ready to give up summer yet, you'll love these stylish but drought-tolerant beauties. Stay with us. Now, isn't this a very beautiful plant? This is actually a crassula and it's a member of the succulent family. In fact, it's related to a plant I know you know, jade plant. And just look at this one. This is an example of a jade plant, but this is actually a new one. This is large jade, and it will grow to an enormous size with great big leaves. 
Now, let's just look at a few other members of this very interesting group of plants. We talked about this agave. Look at this agave. So within a certain family, you're going to get variations that are really fun to collect. And for instance, take a look at this plant. You know the aloe vera that you have in your kitchen window? This is a type of aloe. Now, these plants are really fun to collect because they're so easy to care for. You have to be careful because once you start collecting them, hey, it can get away from you. You know, one of my favorite places to visit is Winnetour. Mr. DuPont, who is responsible for Winnetour, was an avid collector of everything you can imagine. Beautiful furniture, paintings, but also plants. You see, Henry F. DuPont developed this for his family, and today it's open to the public. It also houses a school for historic preservation. You see, the grounds change from season to season and boast a wide array of styles from both formal to whimsical. I caught up with Kathy Metzger, who showed us some of the charming elements of the gardens on the estate. Alan, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to share with you some of the winter products that are available. Well, it's a thrill to be here. Now tell me about this. This is called an armillary sphere. An armillary sphere was an ancient device used to look at the heavens. Sure. This is an exact reproduction. The original of this was used by the conservatory as a focal point. And today it's available, as was the original, in handcrafted wrought iron. Now, would this have been an object that Mr. DuPont found, bought, and brought here to Winnetour? Yes, he was constantly looking for things. Uh, you may or may not know that there are 85,000 objects here in the museum. <laughs> it's staggering. There are additional objects that are used in the gardens. This is an exact reproduction of the sundial that is the focal point of the sundial garden here at Winnetour. Tell me, do, do we know where Mr. DuPont found this particular object and, and much about its age? Not for certain. We're looking at that. With many of our objects, we know exactly where they came from, who owned them before they came to Winnetour. In the case of this, we're still learning about it. Many of the things in the collection you all are reproducing. We are, and in fact, now you can have the interior millwork and architecture for your home as well. So you could do a total winter room. By doing so, we are raising funds that support the educational program of Winter Museum and Country Estate. Thank you so much for sharing this oh, beautiful collection pleasure. of reproductions. Well, it's a fabulous, it's a fabulous collection. I don't do it by myself. It takes everyone at Winnetour who makes this possible for other people to enjoy. Well, keep up the good work. We're glad you like it. Thank you, Alan. From a grand estate, we find ourselves headed to laid back California, hippie plants and bringing the garden indoors, plus keeping it comfortable with propane. The story next. The Pinky Winky Hydrangea is a great hydrangea that I've tested, has great staying power in the garden. You see, the stems are very sturdy, so the blooms don't flop over when it rains. And the Pinky Winky flowers emerge white, and as they mature, the older blooms turn pink at the base, resulting in a shrub with enormous bicolored blooms. It's also an easy hydrangea to grow, and the soil pH has nothing to do with bloom color. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I tried to grow everything, and I loved to grow cactus. You could actually find cactus seed, and you still can. And this is a mixture of several different varieties of cactus, and you can see these tiny seed here. Just look at all of them. Now, all you do is take them and spread them over some moistened soil like this. All right, I'm trying to get equal distribution. And then just gently press them down in that moist soil. Now what I started with here is just a really high quality potting mix. And I moistened it in this container. I think this is a nice decorative container. And now all I have to do is cover it with just a little plastic wrap. You could even take a sandwich bag or something like that and put on it. The idea is, to create a little greenhouse effect, and that's what I have here. This is another way to actually grow them. You see, you can buy these little kits where you have little individual pots like this, and in these pots you get a disc that's pressed or compressed peat moss, and you just simply add water to these discs, and then what happens is they expand and fill the little pot like this. Then you just take and repeat the action 
with the seed, dump them out, and just scatter a few seed on top of each one of these. Really only takes two or three. Moisten, put the little greenhouse top on, and you'll be amazed within a couple of weeks you'll have little cacti growing in these pots. It's a lot of fun. You know, one of my friends, Margie Rader in California, has taken the use of succulents to new heights. She really understands how cool they are and how stylish they can be in any garden setting. Well, Margie, I'm just loving your groovy little pad here you put together. Well, thank you. It's fun. It's kind of our little, our retro pad. Sure. Well, it's a great display that shows how you can use these succulents and so many fun and interesting ways. Your, your artwork on the wall there is fabulous. Thank you. They were big in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. And now they're kind of big again. They make good sense because they require very little care. Now, cacti are succulents. Right. But I don't see you using those in here. Yes, because those would bite. Those <laughs> would leave big pricks in your finger. Sure. This is probably the most prickly one. This is Haworthia zebra stripe. Yeah, beautiful little thing. So what you do is use succulents that are user friendly. Right. Good plan. And in this one dish, it looks like you have about nine, maybe ten varieties. The more variety, the more color, the more texture, the more interesting it is to the eye. Well, it's a little garden. It's a little garden in a box. In a dish. In a dish. And these, I think these are so beautiful. I love the chartreuse glass. But as you can see, there's no drain hole. You know, I, I use lots of containers that don't have any holes in them because they are succulents. You don't need to water them much and I don't want to be limited. Now, what about light? Everything here strikes me as a sun lover. You know, most of this stuff is grown in 75% light. They're gonna perform the best for you outside. Well, it's just gorgeous. It's just a great display. I just applaud your creative gifts. Thank you. I'm glad I can share it with you. Now, this is the part of the show where I take viewer questions and answer them here on the show. Today, I have a question from Rebecca in Charleston, South Carolina, who asks, what could I use to screen or block the view of utilities on my property? Well, Rebecca, at the Garden Home Retreat, we've done several things. As you may know, it's a rural property that I've been developing for the past couple of years. I've used white picket fencing to screen my heating and air conditioning units, and hedges made of holly or boxwood also make excellent screening materials. But in some cases, you can completely remove utilities from sight, as I learned from Tom Jacknick, who told me about new trends with propane tanks. Tell me about this propane tank that'll be in the ground, Tom. Actually, we, we took the propane tank from the backyard to under the backyard. <laughs> We've got 34% of the new homeowners that had homes built in the last 12 months that were beyond the natural gas lines put in an underground propane tank. What I don't like about my situation is that, well, I've got a propane tank sitting out above the ground, and it's really a blight on the landscape. Being a garden designer, what is out in that garden or landscape means a lot to me. No, right here all you see is a dome uh, sticking out about six inches out of the ground and, and about three feet under this is a 500 gallon tank typically for a residential use uh, for propane and it takes gas energy out into the country away from the typical nat natural gas mains. There are tankless gas water heaters that you can save 40 to 50 percent on your right. water heating bill. The outdoor room phenomenon, which yeah. you're very familiar with, is, <laughs> uh, is tailor-made for propane. There's so many activities I enjoy outdoors that involve either heat or light, and propane provides that, whether it's grilling or, or the ambience that the lanterns provide in the garden. It's really fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Next, we'll get a fresh garden recipe, so stay tuned. Now, I don't know about you, but during this time of year, I'm always looking for fresh ways to use my homegrown tomatoes. Chef Mike Selig of Vermilions has an easy recipe that's sure to please you and your guests. Today we're going to show you a fresh tomato salsa using all fresh ingredients from your garden. We're going to use fresh tomatoes, a red bell pepper, and of course, cilantro. You're just going to start cutting the tomato like this using a serrated blade like a bread knife and then you're going to turn it again on its side and then right there you have the diced tomatoes real quick real easy then we're going to take the next preparations we're going to take the 
a red bell pepper. This we're gonna just cut off the ends. You can save the ends and dice them up, put them in your salsa, and then we're gonna cut right down the middle of the pepper, and then we're gonna take the skeleton of the bell pepper out. Zero waste on the bell pepper. Then we're gonna take our chef's knife and cut it into strips and dice them. This is all very important because this is all about the fresh tomato salsa. Then we're gonna chop up fresh cilantro. So what we're gonna do is take the stainless steel mixing bowl, we're gonna take the tomato, dump that in there, the red bell pepper, the fresh cilantro. We're gonna take lemon juice from a fresh lemon, lime juice, this is your acid. This is gonna help break down the tomato, break down the pepper, put a little fresh uh, purple onion in there, some fresh garlic. Again, all items grown from your garden in the back. Fresh jalapeno, give it that little extra kick. And again, come back with some more fresh cilantro. You know, the beautiful thing about this is that if you like more tomato in your salsa, use more tomato. If you like to be a lot spicier, use a lot more jalapeno in there. And then we're just gonna take our tongs and mix it up. This is great for chips. This is great to roll up in a pita or in a tortilla and just have it as a snack. Fresh is where it's all at. When you have something, such good ingredients as these tomatoes and this cilantro and this bell pepper, you gotta keep it all fresh. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. If you get into growing a few of these little cacti yourself, be patient because some of the varieties in a mixed pack like this will take a long time. Some as many as say 50 to 60 days. So just be patient like I said. Hey and if you want that recipe check it out on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time from the garden I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile.